Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we talk with Donna Gilmore of San Onofre Safety on the latest nuclear industry lies, misdirections, and total numbnuts about the safety of dry cask storage. She particularly takes on the recent misdirection by the head of a dry canister manufacturing company on what he said to the state and good people of Vermont regarding the decommissioning of Vermont Yankee. All that, plus numbnuts of the week, activist shout-outs, and more nuclear information than Albert Einstein could have imagined would come from E equals MC squared. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, June 30th, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. Starting here in the U.S., where there is more fallout, you should pardon the expression, from the release of censored U.S. government emails from the period of time immediately after the explosions at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear facility and the start of the ongoing disaster. This is a story that was revealed by ENENews.com, and ENE follows up with an interview with Kevin Camps from Beyond Nuclear, taken from The Big Picture, in which he said, A recent revelation of Nuclear Regulatory Commission internal emails revealed that there was concern at the highest levels of the U.S. government, and rightly so, about the radioactive iodine-131 escaping from Fukushima Daiichi and reaching the United States. Camps related that rainwater at 242 times Safe Drinking Water Act permissible levels was measured in the U.S. that people here, especially on the West Coast, either breathed it in, drank it in milk, or ingested it in other ways. Camps said, the nuclear industry will try to bury the truth, and that sure happened after Fukushima. I think there's been a huge dereliction of duty at the federal and the state levels. This story went on to quote internal emails from March of 2011 by the head of UC Berkeley's nuclear engineering department, who wrote, UCB faculty is in general agreement that prompt action should be taken. Many cases of thyroid cancer and other health problems may end up being attributed to exposures from the Fukushima accident. He was referring to cases of these illnesses on the west coast of the United States. So what's worse, the cancer or being attributed to Fukushima? The story goes on. It is possible that we will find some people have received doses of iodine-131 and other radionuclides that could exceed the levels which protective action guidelines are designed to prevent. It could identify individuals who have had significant exposure, alert them and their medical care professionals to monitor for potential health effects. Instead, on the very day that the radiation plume was expected to hit the United States, a report on San Francisco's ABC station, KGO-TV, cited nuclear engineers at UC Berkeley as saying, don't be alarmed. The tiny particles are just so small, they pose no threat at all, not harmful at all. That TV story went on to assuage the public by saying, there is no plume. Secondly, you cannot predict how the weather is going to carry radiation particles over here to the West Coast, if any at all. So what was it Kevin Camp said? The nuclear industry will try to bury the truth. I think there's been a huge dereliction of duty at the federal and state levels. Yeah. On Tuesday, June 23rd, the Braidwood nuclear plant in Illinois was nearly hit by a tornado. Within the perimeter of the facility, the tornado took down signs, bent utility poles, snapped power lines, and cracked trees in half. This is the second time in two tornado seasons that the nuclear facility has been in the path of a twister. Now, they say that there would be no damage to the nuclear facility, as it has been built to withstand between a 6.0 and a 6.9 quake on the Richter scale. 
apples and oranges. But nobody wants to find out what would actually happen when a nuclear facility is hit by a tornado. These things are just a bad idea. Can't we get rid of all of them? Apparently not, because the final $1.8 billion of federal loan guarantees has been issued to three companies that are in charge of building two new nuclear reactors in Georgia. That's $1.8 billion in taxpayer money, in addition to the $6.5 billion that was already granted in 2014. This is President Obama's payback to some of his largest financial supporters when he originally ran for president in 2008. So they're financing nukes, they're building nukes, but when it comes to dealing with the waste, People aren't so happy with that. A group called Morning Consult conducted a poll that shows that 63% of voters say they would be less likely to vote for a candidate running for federal office who supported building a nuclear waste storage site in their state. This poll also shows that a pronounced majority of registered voters, 77%, said they would not live within 10 miles of a nuclear waste storage site. 63% said they would not live within a 100-mile radius of a nuclear waste storage site. Women, who consistently have the good sense to be adverse to nuclear issues in polling, were among the least likely to say they would live within either 10 or 100 miles of a nuclear waste storage site, with 83% saying no to 10 miles and 64% saying no to 100 miles. Not surprisingly, The group most willing to live within 10 miles of a nuclear waste storage site were Tea Party supporters, but only 24% of them said yes. So it does appear that nuclear waste is one of the ultimate NIMBYs not in my backyards in our country. In North St. Louis County in Missouri, there is new evidence of radioactive contamination near Coldwater Creek where hundreds of cases of cancer have been reported in geographic clusters along that body of water. A grassroots effort to collect information of incidents of cancer was started online by concerned current and former residents of the area. Many believe the radiation caused by radioactive materials left over from World War II are behind the local cancer epidemic. Local resident Michelle Seeger who grew up playing in Coldwater Creek and now has stage four incurable cancer, said, Every person has the right to know what's going on. If you live on contaminated ground, you need to know. If children are playing in parks and digging up dirt, they need to know. But not unexpectedly, a representative of the Army Corps of Engineers, Mike Peterson, said, There's really not an immediate risk to public health. Nice semantics, jerk. Of course it's not immediate risk to public health. It takes years for the illnesses to develop. But that does not mean the cause and effect are not directly connected. Peterson went on to say, because these are low-level doses of radiation, most of it is subsurface, so it's not going to be something people run into just in the day-to-day activities. Yeah, you never heard of dust, gardening, Kids playing in the dirt and then licking their fingers. Dirt on shoes and sandals tracked into homes. What was it Kevin Camp said? The nuclear industry will try to bury the truth. I think there's been a huge dereliction of duty at the federal and state levels. This is just another case of it. Here's hoping these people get some level of satisfaction because at Rocky Flats in Colorado, it's taken more than 25 years for justice to avail itself, and the battle is not necessarily over yet. More than 25 years ago, eight Coloradoans agreed to serve as the representatives for a group of about 13,000 property owners who believed the Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant had contaminated their land with radioactive plutonium. In 2005, after 15 years of pretrial motions practice against the federal contractors, Dow Chemical and Rockwell International, the case finally went to a four-month trial. Jurors deliberated for 17 days and returned a verdict of $177 million in compensatory damages and $200 million in punitive damages. 
Then in 2011, note there were six years of wrangling in between, the 10th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals wiped out the jury verdict, holding that the trial judge was too expansive, instructing the jury about what constitutes a nuclear incident. Dude, if there's radiation released, it's a nuclear incident. So now on Tuesday, June 24th, another four years, a different 10th Circuit panel gave back what the appeals court took away in 2011. The ruling stated in no uncertain terms, Injustice not only in the needless financial expense and the waste of judicial resources, but injustice in the human costs associated with trying to piece together faded memories and long since filed away evidence, the emotional ordeal parties and witnesses must endure in any retrial, the waste of work already performed by a diligent and properly instructed jury, and the waiting the waiting everyone would have to endure for a final result in a case where everyone's already waited too long. This verdict provides welcome relief, but before you jump into a celebratory mode, realize that before a dollar is paid out, Dow Chemical is planning to challenge this verdict as well. In Vermont, Chris Singh, the president and chief executive officer of Holtec International, which designs and sells concrete and steel casks for storage of spent nuclear fuel, told the Vermont Nuclear Decommissioning Citizens Advisory Panel that his casks would be able to last for 300 years. And that's what this week's featured interview is all about. Stay tuned. And now... Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's out of week. The U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission has asked the owners of nuclear fuel facilities to provide more information on how they respond to natural phenomena. Happy bedtime reading, courtesy the Pentagon. I've referenced this before, but the Pentagon has released a 1,176-page book of instructions on, and this is the title, The Law of War. I guess it's a companion piece to Lao Tse's The Art of War. What this book does is detail acceptable ways of killing the enemy. And as I've mentioned on Nuclear Hot Seat before, it includes a justification and a claim of total legality for the use of depleted uranium bombs. Now it turns out that this tome also takes aim at journalists, including the fact that they, we, can be labeled terrorists. It labels journalists as unprivileged belligerents. Excuse me? I thought we were exercising freedom of the press to get the information out as we see it as honestly and objectively as we can. Or, if we're not objective, at least we label what our bias is so that people can filter their understanding through our understanding. Now, the Pentagon was, of course, referring to journalists in a war zone. But considering how nuclear has become such a combative area, that would include me. I guess I am a belligerent journalist of unprivileged persuasion always wondered what to call myself. So thanks, Pentagon, for the unexpected self-definition. But quite frankly, that doesn't prevent you and your 1,176-page book of instructions on the law of war from earning this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. A belligerent journalist of unprivileged persuasion. I think that would look great on a T-shirt. Moving over to Japan, where the Pope's climate change encyclical has really boosted the visibility and actions of faith-based anti-nuclear groups. The Catholic bishops of Japan have issued a statement that reads in part, We as members of the human race have responsibilities to protect all life and nature as God's creation and to pass on a safer and more secure environment to future generations. In order to protect life, which is so precious, and beautiful nature, we must not focus on economic growth by placing priority on profitability and efficiency, but deciding at once to abolish nuclear plants. 
The Anglican Church of Japan has also called for the abolition of nuclear power and the pursuit of alternative energy. And no surprise here that Buddhists have added their voices to this chorus during Japan's Interfaith Forum for the Review of National Nuclear Policy. The Buddhist statement reads in part, No nuclear reactors should be restarted anywhere in the country. All this built upon a statement by the World Council of Churches that was issued last year on July 7, 2014, which calls for divestment from businesses and financial institutions involved in the production of nuclear weapons or nuclear power plants and related exports and advocate for the reallocation of government spending from nuclear weapons and nuclear power plants to the development of renewable energy and the redevelopment of communities where nuclear industries are closing. And to those politicians who claim that religion has no place in deciding issues of nuclear energy or power, Pope Francis recently pointed out in his climate change encyclical that whether the earth and all that is in it can be destroyed by nuclear energy, waste, or weapons is an ethical question. We'll put up a link to some of these articles because the quotes in them are just fabulous. It will be on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 210. Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, has been ordered to pay 27 million yen, the equivalent of $219,500 American, in compensation to the bereaved family of a male evacuee who committed suicide after being displaced due to the 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster. The Fukushima District Court ruled on June 30th that the main reason that Kiichi Isozaki, 67, from Namie near Fukushima nuclear power plant, killed himself was stress related to the nuclear accident. It was the second time a court in Japan has deemed that the Fukushima accident was responsible for an evacuee's suicide. In the first compensation judgment, the utility was ordered to pay about 49 million yen to the family of an evacuee from Kawamata, who killed herself in July of 2011 by setting herself on fire during a trip to her home. When the verdict was rendered, the utility decided not to appeal the ruling, and senior TEPCO officials apologized to the family of the deceased. But now it's four years later, meaning only five years before the 2020 radioactive uh, Tokyo Olympics, and the environment is much different. In this instance, the gentleman committed suicide by jumping into a river from a nearby bridge after developing depression while evacuating from the area of the nuclear accident. This according to the testimony of one of his family members. But this time, instead of issuing an apology, TAPCO claimed, Eh, Isazaki was already suffering anxiety and stress since he had diabetes. What the fuck? What the fuck? I truly don't know how those people from TEPCO can live with themselves. In case you needed something else to worry about, in Japan, the nuclear fuel transport company disclosed over last weekend that the bolts used to secure covers on metal containers for transporting low-level radioactive waste by sea might be failing. Son of a gun. The containers carry drums filled with radiation-tainted clothes and equipment discarded by nuclear power plant workers. The Tokyo-based company, the only one in Japan transporting that kind of waste, said that none of the five, count them, five bolts found so far broke during shipping. Right, like that's supposed to make us feel any better? The Japanese ministry in charge of supervision has ordered the firm to halt all transportation operations until safety measures can be confirmed. The problem was first discovered in February, but nuclear fuel transport, so typical of the nuclear industry, failed to report it to the ministry for more than four months after judging it to be a peculiar case, a one-off. But they're still looking because there are 3,300 such containers all of them made quite recently, between 2011 and 2014, and they are scattered all over the country. Sounds relevant to the interview you're doing about the degradation that can happen to dry cask storage. 
Well, Japan may still be trying to convince the world that the health difficulties faced by its people following Fukushima was based on the fact that they weren't smiling enough. But nothing can be done to convince the animals to stop dying. According to two reports from Fukushima Diary and Iori Mochizuki, large mammals have been dying in rapid succession in the Ueno Zoological Gardens in Higashiyama. The cause of the deaths? Tumors and heart failures, both consistent with exposure to nuclear radiation. Both deaths were in lions, in one case from a thyroid tumor. And at a Tokyo aquarium, in just one week, 40% of their mackerel tuna died. This is the same aquarium where 99% of tuna died earlier this year, so I guess they were restocking. The fish died within two days of being added to the tank. And the cause has not yet been identified. If there's any good news coming out of Japan this week, it's because the famed movie director, Hayao Miyazaki, has given 300 million yen, around $2.4 million U.S., for the construction of an interactive center for children in the town of Kumejima in Okinawa. The facility is intended for families and children who are displaced from Fukushima so that they can be outdoors. That's because since the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster began in 2011, it is no longer safe for children to play outside in Fukushima. The food fight between Japan and South Korea continues with Seoul sticking to its guns about their right to impose an import ban on 50 fishery products from Fukushima Prefecture and seven adjacent prefectures. Japan is protesting this ban. It will look so bad to those people who are stupid enough to show up for the 2020 radioactive uh, Tokyo Olympics. And South Korea apparently continues to not give up, maintaining that its measures are still necessary to ensure the safety of its people. Germany is in final stages of a nuclear phase-out of a 33-year-old reactor in Bavaria and a new wildfire adjacent to the Chernobyl evacuation zone is sending clouds of smoke over the area. No word if it has had any effect on the radiation levels. We'll have the week's featured interview in just a moment, but first, Nuclear Hot Seat really does rely on your donations to keep us moving ahead. My gratitude to those of you who donate when, how much, and how often you can. Some of you make a single donation, others a small recurring payment, and know that all of it goes towards keeping this show alive. So if you find that nuclear hot seat sticks in your brain, sticks in your craw, makes you angry, makes you laugh, think, helps you understand the nuclear issue, and not be so alone with your awarenesses, help us keep doing it. Just go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down on the home page, and click on the big red Donate button. Whatever you can do to help, thank you. Last week, as was mentioned in the news section, the President and Chief Executive Officer of Holtec International spoke to the Vermont Nuclear Decommissioning Citizens Advisory Panel on the safety of his company's Holtec's Nuclear waste storage canisters, claiming they would last 300, count them, 300 years. As with all matters dealing with dry cask storage, Nuclear Hot Seat decided to check in again with Donna Gilmore, founder of San Onofre Safety. Donna knows so much about high burn-up nuclear fuel and dry cask storage that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission had her speak to their people in Washington, D.C., where she proved that she knew things that a lot of them didn't. So listen up, people of Vermont and people any place else that has a nuclear reactor or storage facility nearby, whether still running or already shut down, because the decisions that get made now about so-called spent fuel storage are going to affect us for longer than any of us can possibly imagine. Donna Gilmore, always a pleasure to have us join us here on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you for uh, having me. I've got lots of information to share today. Let's get started. Let's start off in Vermont. 
Last Thursday night, Chris Singh, the president of Holtec, which is the company that designs and sells the giant concrete and steel dry cast intended to store Vermont Yankees and so many other nuclear reactors' waste for the foreseeable future, told a Vermont panel that his invention, his dry caps, will last for 300 years. From your perspective, true or false? That's absurd. It's totally false. Uh, and by the way, there I don't think there are any experts. Uh, I'm definitely not an expert, and apparently he isn't either. I reviewed the slides of his presentation and found very many misleading statements. Give us some examples of those misleading statements. He said, number one, he said, uh, no loaded canister of Holtex has ever leaked in long-term storage. Well, guess what? They haven't even been used for uh, 15 years, so they've never been used in long-term storage. So that's a safe statement for him. He never mentions whether they have cracks or not, since they can't inspect for cracks, and, and he doesn't mention that you can't repair them even if you could find the cracks. And he had, what presented to the local community here near San Onofre in Southern California, and he admitted, and we have him on video, stating that you can't repair these. And he admits that they don't have inspection technology to even find cracks. So he's leaving things out of his presentation in Vermont. It's very misleading. Then he has a pie chart that says that the High Storm multi-purpose canister system is the most widely used canister system in the world. Well, it might be the most widely used canister system. However, most of the world uses a cask system. So a simple word change that nobody would pick up but maybe apparently me. The most widely used storage system is the thick cast system. Germany uses a thick ductile cast iron up to 20 inches thick. At Fukushima, they use a thick cast steel system, not as thick as the German one. They don't use thin canisters like Holtec uses and most of the U.S. uses. The U.S. market uses these thin half-inch steel canisters that are subject to cracking from the environment. These thin canisters, they haven't been used. It's an immature technology. They haven't been used for more than 20 years in the U.S., most of them a lot less. And it takes about 20 years, close to 20 years, before you'll start seeing uh, through-wall cracks, where they crack all the way through the wall of that half-inch thick canister. And what happens if it cracks all the way through? Well, what? according to Dr. Singh, the vendor of Holtec, and we have him on video saying this, he said, well, first you have to find the crack and try to repair it in the face of millions of curies of radiation and from even a microscopic crack. And we have this on video. People can go to my homepage, sananofreesafety.org. I have a statement there. You click, and it'll take you right to the video. So we're we're not making this up. But you know, he chose not to share that information uh, with the people in Vermont. And then he talks about that the Ukraine is using uh, this technology. Well, Ukraine has bought a different version of the whole tech technology. They haven't implemented it yet. I doubt if they have anything but Holtec sales pitch that they're buying it based on. You know, I've studied what the Ukraines are buying, and I wouldn't want that system either. It's got two walls, two steel walls in, in the thin canisters, but the outer layer is even thinner than what we have. And it, anyway, they they can't be inspected. They still have cracking issues. So it's really a, a statement with little meaning. It's just meant to mislead. And he didn't mention the fact that right now we've got almost close to 2,000 of these thin canisters installed in the United States. And we don't know if any of them are starting to crack because they have no technology to inspect for cracks. I have, none of them have been checked for that. So he doesn't mention that either. And we don't know if they have cracks, how deep those cracks are. And there's no seismic rating for a crack canister. So when he talks about this great seismic, you know, oh, they're really designed for higher than Fukushima, and he doesn't mention the fact that these things are cracked. All of that goes out the window. And he doesn't mention that there's no early warning monitoring system. We will only know after they leak radiation into the environment. 
the technology used in the rest of the world. They have monitor, early warning monitoring. They have bolted lids with double seals in them, and they monitor. So if there's any pressure change, then you get immediate notification that there's a problem, and then you can deal with it. You can replace the seal. As regards Vermont Yankee, the article that I read said that the canisters were two-inch thick stainless steel, which, of course, is thicker than what we've been discussing here on the West Coast for standard operators. I don't know where that two-inch stainless steel came from. It's not, they're not talking about the thin canister that the, the uh, fuel is loaded into. They're not talking about that. If you look at that article, you'll see a drawing of the canister, and it points to that inner thin steel canister, and it says right there, 0.5 inches. So he must be referring to some other part of the system, or it's, it's an error. I would have to go back. I've read the technical specifications. They're on the NRC website. I've read the technical specification for that system. I can go back and see if there, there's something that's uh, two inches and maybe in that concrete outer cast. The problem is, what he didn't mention is that the concrete overpack that looks very big and massive, he doesn't mention that there's vents, air vents in that, because the thin canister is so hot from all that fuel, there has to be air vents to let the heat out or it'll overheat. So really, we're just counting on that half-inch thick canister not to crack through because if it does that radiation will go out those air vents so it's a very misleading picture he doesn't mention the air vents in his presentation no and he does have two other points here that make it sound like they're in his favor and of course this is all nuclear industry double speak but i'd like your take on it one of them is that he said that radiation emitted by the casks holding the high level fuel is only 20 percent of the radiation standard set by the federal government what in the world is he trying to make us believe with that well you know i don't know if that's a true statement or not so i really i really can't address that point and i don't think that means that it means it's safe I don't know how that has a lot of meaning. I'm not too concerned about it with it sitting there. I mean, if we keep a decent distance from it. My concern is the weak link is that half-inch thick canister that's subject to cracking from environmental conditions. The stainless steel has a very thin film on it that makes it stainless. And anything that degrades that, can start the cracking process, and then it'll take about 16 years for that crack to move all the way through the canister. In uh, South Africa, there's a nuclear plant, and they have a t- the, this tank that was made out of the same material, manufactured the same way as the whole tech thin canisters. It had a through-wall crack in 17 years, and it was thicker than the whole tech canisters. It was uh, 0.62 inches, where the Holtex are 0.5 inches. And Holtex doesn't mention that either. Of so, course not. They're a corporation. They're trying to sell their product. Yes, and EPRI, a lab that uh, does reports and things for the nuclear industry and, and for the government also, they produced a report last year trying to claim that for San Onofre, they would hold up at least 85 years. I read the report, what they left out. They left out the example of the Coburg nuclear plant, and I learned about that early failure of the Coburg nuclear plant from the NRC. I listened to NRC technical presentations. That's where you really find what's really going on. By the time it gets to NRC management, it's all covered over normally. That's a game of telephone. It goes from one mouth to one ear. And I know. It's more an intentional thing of what they want to share with the public, maybe even with the commission. It isn't just interpretation. I've dealt with Mark Lombard, who's the director of all things spent fuel management at the NRC. And I get a lot of the straight scoop from his employees. But from him, you know, it's another story. And I know he knows better because he sits in on these same technical meetings that I listen to and things that, you know, he agrees to verbally, then he starts changing his story. I think there's a lot of good employees at the NRC, a lot of good workers. There may be some, you know, good managers too, but I'm very concerned about 
how things are managed in the spent fuel division. There is a report by EPRI, which is a national organization that does scientific reporting for the nuclear industry, the NRC, various institutions, and a lot of nuclear stuff. And they did a report claiming 85 years is at least how long the canisters would last. However, they cherry-picked data to come to that conclusion. They left out data that I got the data right from the NRC, and they know they know this information at EPRI. They left out the Coburg plant that had a tank fail in 17 years. They left out the fact that Diablo Canyon had a canister that EPRI actually inspected and got paid to do this. They left out the fact that they found salts and moist air and a low enough temperature at Diablo Canyon on a canister that it could have uh, stress corrosion cracking caused from uh, the salt corrosion. In a two-year-old canister, this canister was only loaded with fuel for two years, and it already had all the conditions for stress corrosion cracking. We don't know if it's cracking because they have no technology to inspect for cracks, but they know all the conditions are there. The NRC had originally told me that it would be at least 30 years before the canister would be cool enough for salts to dissolve and, and, and corrode the, the surface of the canister. Well, but they found one at a two-year-old Diablo Canyon canister, and they didn't mention that in their report. Now, there are other problems that have been coming up at Diablo Canyon. Tell us about the new discovery that's been made up there about loading these canisters. Yes, there was a event notice on June 6th. Uh, it was reported by PG&E to the NRC that they've got 19 canisters that were loaded incorrectly. When you say loading, are you talking about the canisters themselves were loaded somewhere, or is this about loading the spent fuel rods, the so-called spent fuel rods, into the canister itself? Yes, it's it's about loading the spent fuel rods in the canister. Actually, they they refer to them as fuel assemblies. The assembly is made up of multiple rods. They, they assemble the rods together and they call it a fuel assembly. At Diablo Canyon, they use Holtec canisters and each one of those canisters holds 32 fuel assemblies. They're required to put them in 32 slots and the technical specifications say that the ones that have cooled the longest in the spent fuel pools need to go in the outer slots of that canister, and the hotter ones need to go in the inner slots. They did the opposite. They loaded the cool ones on the inside and the hot ones on the outside. Now, why would they do that? And then the spec says this will never happen. They will never get loaded wrong. We have all these quality checks. It will never get loaded wrong. Therefore, it will be impossible for this to ever go wrong. So this is one of the things that they claim why we're never going to have problems with dry storage. And they specifically put in the technical specifications that we have such quality checks, we will never load these canisters backwards, basically. And, that, and that's just what they did. So, so much for that confidence. Now, why would they do that? Why would they load them wrong? Other than sheer incompetence? Well, no, I don't I don't think that's it. I'm still digging through this. One of the things I found is there's fewer slots that you can use for fuel that hasn't cooled as long. That would mean that they would have to cool the fuel longer in the pools before they could put it in the caps. So the bottom line is the way they loaded it meant that they could expedite loading fuel out of the pool. They wouldn't have to let it cool as many years before they put it in the canister, the way, that, the way they chose to do it. And PG&E sent a letter to the NRC that said, we need a license amendment or our pools will be full. And then they obviously wouldn't be able to run the reactor if their pools are full. So they aren't able to expedite the loading of the fuel out of the pool into the canisters. You basically got constipation, so to speak, and, and they would not be able to, you know, keep running the reactor if they couldn't unload the fuel in the pool. So this would be grounds for Diablo Canyon to be shut down. Yeah.
not ground. I mean, it would basically have to shut down because, uh, yes, you're right, because they're out of compliance with how many years the fuel has to cool safely before it can be put in a canister, yes. Now, I can't say that that's why they did it. I'm just saying that at the point of my research so far, that that is definitely looks like a possibility that needs to be checked into a little further. Okay. They admitted that they loaded it incorrectly, that they did not have a license amendment. They didn't have the NRC approval. They didn't have a license amendment to do what they did. They admitted that. But of course, now, the NRC is saying, oh, it's safe. Don't worry about it. So is there any way for them to unload and reload and get it right this time? Or are they just going to let it ride? I'm hoping we get some kind of written documentation from the NRC. I have a policy that I don't put anything on my website that I don't have a, an official document to back up, you know, what I have on the website. So all I have is some verbal indications that they're going to let this go. They're saying that it's safe enough and they're not going to make them unload it. And I am communicated with a couple of people from Mothers for Peace that attended a recent NRC meeting and, and met with the inspectors on this issue, and, and there's still more questions we have that we don't have answers to. So I've been working with them and giving them some questions, but it's still all being put together. But, uh, yeah, I mean, if you think about it, if they fill up the pools and the only way they can get in the canisters fast enough is that they have to, you know, allow a change in the NRC's requirements for how long it has to cool. I mean, they they make these decisions on heat load and, and in what spot each canister needs to be put in. They do that. They make all these heat calculations. There's a, there's a lot of effort that goes into that. The NRC staff does review the calculations, and, and I have seen where the NRC has actually said to Holtec, no, no, you haven't justified that heat load, you know, so you have to step it down. They, they actually have insisted on, a, on another situation that I've um, seen where the NRC has actually pushed back and not given Holtec what they wanted. If they had to unload that fuel, they're really not set up to do it. You've got spent fuel pools that are already filled with fuel, the temperature of the fuel, the temperature of the water in the pools, is very different than what the temperature will be of these uh, fuel assemblies in the dry storage. So there's potential issues of trying to take fuel from a dry canister and put it back in a pool. You could have some unintended consequences. Now, once a pool is totally empty, then you want to keep the pools and do that kind of thing. So they really are not prepared. If they do this wrong, they're not prepared to fix it. These are welded canister lids, so you have to cut them off. They're totally useless after you do that, and it all has to be done underwater. So, no, that's a big problem. If the NRC wanted to tell them to do it, they have no way to do it anyway. Whoa, talk about buying a pig in a poke. What can you tell us about the status of the case with the California Public Utilities Commission? The issue that I'm focused on, where I'm putting my time, is the decommissioning proceeding this one, I believe, is the most critical because Edison now wants to buy these inferior whole tech canisters, even though they know they have these cracking issues. They're in an environment just like the Coburg, South Africa plant. We've got salt air, onshore winds, moisture. We've got all the conditions for our canisters to crack all the way through in 17 years, Okay. And that's about five years away from today. They started loading those canisters in 2003. And I am seriously thinking I may sell my house. If we can't get better storage canisters, I don't think it's a good investment to stay here. Tell people how far away from San Onofre you live. I'm about five miles away as the crow flies. The border of San Clemente is about two miles away from San Onofre, and I'm five miles away in San Clemente. But, you know, the radiation will go a lot farther than San Clemente. And also you're talking about, you know, that would block I-5. The the nuclear plant is right next to the I-5 freeway. So going down to San Diego or Mexico or going up from there to Orange County, L.A. and the rest. So you're talking a major problem. In this PUC proceeding, 
my case that I'm making there, the, the, we have no jurisdiction over radiation at the state level. However, we do have jurisdiction over costs, and the PUC, the Public Utility Commission, can approve or disapprove that Holtec contract. They can choose not to give Edison the billion-plus dollars that they want for managing the, the waste there. And I'm contending that the selection of the Holtec canister is a bad financial decision because they could start failing in 20 years, they can't be repaired, and so you're looking at spending another billion or so dollars to buy systems again. With the technology used in most of the rest of the world, the thick cast technologies, those have proven to last over 40 years. The ductile cast iron ones made in Germany, they don't have cracking issues. They have they automatically arrest. If there's uh, any kind of crack issues, it automatically arrests. And they're up to 20 inches thick. So we're talking a half-inch thick material with Holtec versus almost 20 inches thick. Germany and um, uh, Japan with Fukushima and other countries, they house these thick casts inside buildings for extra environmental protection, extra radiation protection. So they just they do a lot better job, and they have redundancy. They have a lot of redundancy. So if one part fails, there's something else there. For example, if a, if a seal fails, they've got two lids, so you can one lid could fail, and you, and you still don't have a problem. We're sitting here with these. Um, actually, they're going to make five-eighth-inch thick ones for us. Like, that's really going <laughs> to Steph's going to make it. You know, I mean, this is – it sounds like – one of the advisories that they would put along with the purchase of this is keep your fingers crossed. Well, you know, I I have another expression. Uh, I think I think what we need to do here to prepare the emergency plan here at this point is to get yourself a yoga book and practice bending over and kissing your own butt goodbye. <laughs> so I just want to say on the CPC thing uh, in terms of timeline. I, I, I have to submit testimony July 15th, and in the end of August there will be some three hearings in San Francisco. And what I need from the public is, is for them to get involved and put some pressure on their elected officials so that it's more than just Donna Gilmore caring about this. I mean, the co I, I believe Commissioner Florio, who is in the, the proceeding that I'm in, I believe he wants to do the right thing. He understands the problem with the canisters. He knows we don't have the money to, to buy them again. You know, he wants something that lasts a long time. Um, but, you know, he works for Jerry Brown, so he's going to do whatever his boss tells him to do. And I'm not sure that Jerry Brown or the people that are advising him are giving him the truth. So we need some pressure uh, in that area so that they know people are watching. And I've got a, a section on my website for cities called Cities, and you can go there. You can get sample resolutions for your city council to pass, and that asks them to write letters to these various political folks to express your concerns. So I've got like a template there, and I'd be happy to go and make presentations in front of city councils and that kind of thing and educate some people. I've got videos online. People can learn about this. I've got sample presentations. So I've made kind of a – self-service kit. So we really, is a, this is a critical time period right now, and it really affects the whole country, not just California. But the fire right. is starting here at San Onofre. So hopefully people listening will get involved. And the reason that this is so important here in California is that this is just a preview of what any community will be going through when a nuclear reactor gets decommissioned. Well, it's not, unfortunately, it's not just decommissioning plants because pretty much all of the nuclear plants around the nation have been loading their fuel into these thin, dry canisters because they need to make space to keep making more waste. So this really affects existing, and, and the timeline, the ticking time bomb we have is these up to 2,000 canisters could already be starting to crack, and we don't know. And it would take about 20 years, depending on when the crack starts. If it starts, you know, within a first year or two, you're talking about, you know, 20 years before you could have a through wall crack. So this affects people that have operating reactors and decommissioned reactors. We, we all have different 
situations at the state level of what we can and can't do. You know, in California, we do have the Public Utility Commission, so we have an avenue. But if, if we can get San Onofre, we can get Edison to standardize on higher quality canisters that are maintainable, that can be repaired, monitored. If we can set the standard here, then that will open the door to spreading that elsewhere, to other places in California, to other nuclear plants across the country. The, the standard needs to change in the United States. We need to be doing what most of the rest of the world is. Each canister contains more radiation than was released from Chernobyl. More cesium-137 is contained in one canister than was released from Chernobyl. And by San Onofre, we've got 50 of them that have fuel assemblies in them. So that's 50 Chernobyls sitting on our coastline. Right. Yeah, and that doesn't count Humboldt, and that doesn't count Diablo Canyon. Well, Donna, thank you for your efforts and for being so generous and sharing your time and expertise. We will continue to be in touch. And on behalf of the listeners to Nuclear Hot Seat, thanks for being with us today. I have enjoyed it. Thank you. That was Donna Gilmore of San Onofre Safety. You can access the information she mentioned and all of those juicy resources for getting your local government, your local towns and city councils active and speaking out on the nuclear issue by going to sananofresafety.org. Activist shout-outs. Mazel tov to longtime activist Harvey Wasserman on his four-part Solartopia radio series this week on KPFK, Pacifica Radio here in Los Angeles. Harvey landed prime airtime June 29th through July 2nd to talk about nuclear issues here in California, which of course reverberate elsewhere in the country and around the world. You can access the recordings at kpfk.org, or if you hear Nuclear Hot Seat in time, listen to Harvey live online at whatever equates to where you are at 3 p.m. Pacific time. Then, let KPFK know that you want more, more, more coverage of nuclear issues. It would be great to get Solartopia on the entire Pacifica network, don't you think? And speaking of programs, if you can figure out Google+, Plus, I'm still challenged in this area, but if you're not, that's where Dave Parrish holds Fuku Friday Happy Hour Hangout every Friday from 4 to 6 Pacific time. It's a loose high-spirited collection of comments, observations, input, brainstorming, and community building. Everyone is invited to show up and participate. Now, you do need to sign up for Dave's email notification in order to access it, and I will have a link up so that you can do so on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 210. Meanwhile, Dave Parrish and I are cooking up some exciting things for Nuclear Hot Seat. Stay tuned. Here's today's final thought. It's too hot. I need sleep. I have no thoughts. I'm out of here. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, June 30th, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from ENEnews.com, KGO-TV, ABC7 in Chicago, MorningConsult.com, KSDK.com, Reuters.com, a wider perspective.wordpress.com, RutlandHerald.com, Fukushima-Diary.com, and our friend Iori Mochizuki, JapanTimes.com, Tokyo Electric Power Company, AnimeNewsNetwork.com, AnglicanNews.org, JNEB.JP slash English, miningawareness.wordpress.com, rt.com, feist.com, plots.com, informable.com, and the esteemed Lucas Hickson. Counterpunch.org, thelancet.com, the sad sacks at worldnuclearnews.com, and the brave, bold, heroic members of the Nuclear Hot Seat community on Facebook, which you're all invited to join. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on iTunes under podcasts. Our 209, count them, 209 archived episodes are available on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com, or on iTunes. And our YouTube channel carries the show under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, 
or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halady and Harder Street Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. We're going out on a song I got from Kumar Sundaram and Dianuks on Facebook. It's a rap blues number by Arinjoy Sarkar called Uranium Blues. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, a belligerent journalist of unprivileged persuasion, reminding you that now as of June of 2015, Nuclear Hot Seat is listened to in 59 countries on six continents. So we've all around the world had our nuclear wake-up call. Don't go back to sleep because we are all in the nuclear hot seat.